In this world today, there are two theories in regard to the origin of this earth and the people who dwell upon it. One is the story of creation as told in the Bible, and the other, of course, is the evolutionistic theories as told by the scientists in their highest stations in this world. Let's turn to Exodus 20 and verse 11 to note the simple Bible account of how long it took to make the heavens and the earth. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all, all, that, in the, all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now the Bible says in six days God made the heavens and the earth, and all that is found therein. And this account, of course, is given back in the first and second chapters of the book of Genesis, which we'll note in just a few moments. Now, against this, men, men consider that this earth has taken millions of years to evolve from the very most primitive forms into its present complex systems. And uh, recently, probably about 25 years ago now, man came up with what he felt was the most convincing of all the evidences to prove the earth was at least 30 million years of age. And this witness is called the radiocarbon clock. It's based upon the principle that this earth is being bombarded from outer space at all times by cosmic rays which deposit radiocarbon-14 in all living organisms. And this continues as long as the organism lives, be it a tree, an animal, a plant, or a man. But when that organism dies, there begins a very, a very uh, fixed rate of, of degeneration in the radiocarbon-14 con content. When they discovered this um, measurement of breakdown of the radiocarbon-14 content, they began to test their equipment on various known pieces of ageing material. They went back to extremely old buildings and took pieces of wood from those buildings and measured the radiocarbon content and found that their readings gave an exact correspondence with the age of the tree or of the timber as already known. And they went back 2,000 years, 3,000 years, 4,000 years and found the reading was accurate all the way. Having satisfied themselves that they had a reliable measurement in this piece of equipment, they then took unknown uh, time pieces such as coal, for instance, and found that the reading jumped up to about 30 million years because there's no radiocarbon content in the coal whatsoever. And they assumed that there had been a total breakdown of the radiocarbon-14 in that particular material, which would take at least 30 million years to accomplish. Let's turn now to Second Peter chapter 3 and note wherein they have made their very serious oversight or their very serious mistake. Because these computations depend upon the assumption that all things have broken down at the same rate from the very beginning. There's been no great climactic changes in the earth or that which surrounds the earth. Let's notice Second Peter chapter 3 and uh, verse 3 and onwards. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, what do scoffers say? They say all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. There's been no change. All things have gone on from the very start. Now, if the scoffers say that, is it the truth? No, it can't be because the scoffers are categorised here as being not speakers of truth, but rather of an error. So if the scoffers say all things continue as they were, what does the Christian say? They don't. They can't. There must be a change. Now, where, when did this great change take place? Verse 5 and 6 and 7 make, make it very plain. For this they willfully forget, that by the, by the word of God the heavens were of old and the, and the earth standing standing out of the water and, out, and in the water, by which the world which then existed perished being flooded with water. Now, the great change came at the flood, which was 1646 years after the creation of this world. The scoffers say no change, 
but the word of God says that they forget that there was a great change that took place at the time of the flood. Now between, as I said a moment ago, between creation, see for creation, and the flood was 1646 years, as I, as I remember. 1646 years, and then came the flood. And I want to demonstrate today that conditions upon the earth were vastly different before the flood from what they have been ever since the flood, and which greatly affects the radiocarbon-14 content in all living organisms between that time and today and accounts for the fact that coal gives a reading of something like 30 million years on the assumption that there's been a complete breakdown of the radiocarbon-14 content and wood and such since the time of the flood of course is a much less a much uh, less time period of breakdown let's go back now to Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 26 to notice a, uh, a statement here in regard to the sun and the moon and their relationship to climatic conditions before the flood came. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 26, which reads as follows. <clears throat> this, this is a statement referring to the restoration of God's creation at the end of time when the new heavens and the new earth shall be made. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In the day which the Lord, when the Lord make, binds up the breach of his people, and he was a stroke of their wound. And we're here told that the light of the moon should be equal to the sun. So we have the moon, it will equal the sun as it presently is. And the sun will equal seven suns, or the light of seven days which means a total of eight times the amount of heat and light being shed upon this earth which we presently have at this point of time. Let's read the verse again to make that very clear in our mind. Verse 26. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals a stroke of their wound. Now, when the sun is restored to seven times its present brightness and the moon becomes as bright as the sun, this will be the restoration of that which occurred in the stroke or the bruising of the people. The stroke of their wound is the thought expressed there. Now, what does the word stroke indicate? Something that is sudden, right? A stroke. When an ageing man or woman suffers a stroke, it's a very sudden thing, is it not? It's instant virtually. One moment they're well, the next moment they're deprived of much of their, of their body uh, function, excuse me, functions and powers. <coughs> excuse me. So we're looking for some sudden stroke that took place upon the human family. What is the only sudden stroke which enveloped the entire world between creation and today? The flood. There was no other but the flood. There have been strokes, of course, on limited geographical areas such as great storms, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions and so on, but no universal stroke that, that uh, hit all the people at the same time. Now, moving on to Isaiah 60 and verse 20, we find a further statement in regard to uh, this. Isaiah 60 and verse 20. Your sun shall no longer go down, and nor shall your moon withdraw itself. The Lord will be your everlasting light and the days of your morning shall be ended. Now, we're told that there's going to be a restoration from, from a certain level. If we draw a graph here, of course, we'll come from this point down to the place where we are right now, and a return back to a point where the sun will be seven times and the moon is bright, so making a total of eight times as much heat altogether. So, therefore, the stroke of the wound took away uh, seven-eighths of the heat and light which, which was there back in the beginning. But when God makes this restoration, the promise is your sun shall no longer go down. Go down from uh, seven suns to one sun, and your moon shall not withdraw itself. Now today the moon is no longer a self-luminous a self body as a reflector, it's a mirror. It, does, it's not, it doesn't have the power to shine by its own strength. 
So the moon has been withdrawn. It was once a light in its own power. It's now been completely withdrawn as simply a hunk of cold, dead dirt up there in the sky, nothing better than a mirror or a reflector. But the sun was not withdrawn, fortunately. It went down from seven times to one time of the original brightness. Now, the first folk may say, well, that's going to produce an, a, a, an impossible situation for living because with eight times the heat and light coming, we'll all perish in just no time at all. But let's go back to Genesis, the first chapter, and trace through what took place on creation's first few days to appreciate that this would actually produce upon the earth a perfect climatic condition far better than we personally enjoy here today. In Genesis chapter 1, we begin the record of creation in the following words, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. How much dry land was apparent at this point of time? None whatsoever. The entire earth was flooded here, as it was to be flooded again when the flood came in Noah's day. So let's draw a diagram now to illustrate this point. That date should be 1656, I think, by the way, if I remember correctly. Now I had my facts a little bit wrong. It's 1656, not 1646. Right, let's draw a diagram now to illustrate the Earth as it was on that first day of God's creative work. You'll need to draw an orb which was completely immersed in water no dry land being apparent whatsoever in any place on the entire globe. So here is the earth, and, and around, of course, is this flood of waters. A situation to be repeated again a few centuries later when Noah was upon the earth. We move on now to verse um, 3, which says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that was good, and God divided the light and the darkness, and God called the night day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now what is a firmament? An expanse, an empty space, is what we call, of course, the atmosphere that surrounds the earth. If you look in the margins of your ordinary King James Version, you'll find the word firmament is explained to be a, an expanse. Now this firmament was to be, be between the waters, dividing the waters from the waters. Now let's see how it did this in verse 7. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So now, if we take the water upon the earth, which we have drawn here, and divided between two bodies of water, one below and the other above the firmament, we find that we end up with a... We have, we have water upon the earth, filling certain oceans and covering certain areas, and there's dry land as well, and there's expanse between the earth and the water above, and up here was a mantle or envelope of water which completely surrounded the earth like a great um, swaddling cloth or cocoon which then gives us the picture of a body of water above the earth, and a body of water on the earth, and the firmament in between to divide the waters which were under it from the waters which were above it. And that is a picture of things as God set it up on the original days of creation. And... Um, this becomes quite plain as you read verse 8 and 9. And God called the firmament heaven, so, that, so the evening and the morning were the second day. So this firmament became known as heaven. Not, of course, the heaven of heavens where God dwells, but that immediate heaven next to the earth, which we normally call our atmosphere, where the birds fly and aeroplanes also wing their way. The word heaven applies to that atmosphere, to the starry heavens, and finally, of course, to God's throne or God's home somewhere out there in the universe. So it's, it's, it's a word which has at least three meanings. Now we move on to verse 9. Then God said, Let the waters under the, under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So on the third day, we find the dry land appears for the first time as the waters divide from the waters on the earth and the waters which were above the earth. Um, now verse 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. 
And then after this, of course, comes the grass and the trees and the animals and finally man. And last of all, the establishment of the seventh day Sabbath as a memorial of all this mighty creative work. Now let's see what role the sun and the moon play in this, in this drama. Verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so. Then God made two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the less light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now, let's look now at a sun out here, a monstrous orb, of course, which is vastly great, much larger than our earth is. And this sun is seven, is seven times as bright as our present sun is, seven times. And let's put the moon, which is about 240,000 miles away, the sun being 93 million miles away, and this is equal to one sun. All told, of course, they would um, produce eight times the present light and heat which is coming to this earth. Now you, you understand that in order for water vapour to be suspended in the atmosphere, we have to have heat energy. And the larger amount up there, the more heat energy which is required to, to keep it up there. That's why in, in tropical areas you find the thunderstorms are much more violent than they are in uh, subtropical or temperate zones. Your storms down here are nothing compared to the wild storms that get, out, get in the far north of Queensland or the great cyclone which built across the Pacific and, and destroy the islands of the sea out there. Now, in order then to maintain this water vapour in the atmosphere, an enormous volume of it, there would have to be an extremely bright or very hot sun and also a moon to act as a balance to the sun and also heat the atmosphere around the earth. And as this heat energy came down toward the earth day by day, it was able to support in the atmosphere this vast amount of water. Now, I don't know whether it was, whether it was clear or... or or they could see the stars and the sun through that, I'm sure they could. But um, the energy was required to do that. Now, because of the thickness of the band of clouds around the Earth, it absorbed so much of the sun's heat that only a certain amount of the light and heat reached the Earth's surface, which was just the right amount to maintain a perfect temperature clear around the world. Now... <clears throat> This gave a glasshouse effect because we know today that if you have a clear night in the winter time, it gets very cold, doesn't it? <coughs> Whereas if you have a cloudy, a cloudy night in the winter time, it, it, it keeps quite warm. The presence of cloud there surrounding the Earth maintains or confines the, the heat which rises from the Earth's surface and is kept inside this area just as heat is kept inside a glasshouse and thus prevents the escape of that heat which rather circulates around the entire world and gives the polar regions, both north and south polar regions, about the same temperature as you find at the, at the equator. Whereas today, of course, we have a vastly different uh, range of temperature, very hot at the equator and very, very cold at the polar regions. Now, very clear proof there's not a lot of speculation is contained in the fact that there has been discovered at the South Pole, for instance, enormous deposits of coal and active volcanoes, which demonstrate the fact that in those areas there used to be tremendous forests which have been buried by the flood and turned into coal. Likewise, the North Polar regions, animals have been found, deep frozen mastodons and so forth, who once dwelt in those places where they had to have green grass and such like things to survive for very long. Now, such was the situation before the flood, and very obviously, radiocarbon-14 bombardments from outer space would be absorbed by the atmosphere, by the clouds around the Earth, and never ever reach the Earth's surface at all. So we come down and take a tree growing upon the Earth before the flood. How much radiocarbon-14 would that tree actually absorb? None at all. None whatsoever. Because of the protection afforded by the deep cloud layers around the Earth. When the flood came and buried that tree beneath the Earth's surface, that, that tree turned to coal, how much radiocarbon-14 would be found in that piece of coal? Again, none whatsoever. 
Now, this means there are two, there are two reasons as to why that coal should have no radiocarbon poured in, in whatsoever. The scientists or evolutionists who teach that all things continue as they were from the very beginning will claim that that, that coal, 30 million years ago, received its quota of radiocarbon-14, but in, in the succeeding 30 million years between then and at the present time, 30 million years is quite a long time, really, there has been a steady breakdown of radiocarbon-14 until none is left, and therefore the absence of any radiocarbon-14 proves that, there, proves that that thing is 30, 30 million years long. The other position is this, that because all things do not continue as they were from the very beginning, because there is one same mantle of water vapour around the Earth uh, protecting it from this bombardment, the coal never had, never had any in the first case and therefore it reached nothing in the second case and therefore proves that there was in fact a great flood. Now you may ask of course then, how came the great flood? Let's turn to Genesis the sixth chapter and we find that um, they developed on the earth at that time an amazing apostasy from the truth of God and a separation from the God of heaven. And this of course was the uh, first step in the drum which led to the flood coming. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. His days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the doors of men and they brought children to them. Those were the mighty men who were old men of renown. <clears throat> then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's a very, very definite relationship between the increasing apostasy of man and the separation of God from man. Let's turn now to Hebrews, the first chapter, to note the very beautiful truth that... Um, God not only made the earth, but moment by moment he sustains the earth, keeps it going on its course. Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3, which deal with the relationship of Christ as created to God the Father in his place as supreme ruler of the universe. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. God, who at various times and in divers ways spoken in the time past the father by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, who is appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the, the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, the two truths I want to bring from this, this text are as follows. Through whom also he made the worlds, so in the first case, Jesus Christ was the creator who made the earth at God's command. But secondly, he upholds all things by the word of his power. So, Jesus Christ at God's command was the maker or the creator of this earth. But not only that, he was also the upholder or sustainer of the entire universe. Now one thing is very, very clear. Man does not have the power to sustain himself. He may argue that he does because he says, well, we look after ourselves, we, we, we mine for minerals and we bore down for oil, we have our own energy sources and we manage quite nicely. But who put all those things there in the first case? God put them all there in the first case. And when man runs out of all these things that God has made, then what's his situation going to be? Can he generate for himself these great resources? Impossible. Absolutely impossible. And the entire universe is, is dependent moment by moment upon God to sustain it and, and keep it on its course. Now, when men recognize and depend upon God as their source, he's able to fulfill that role and provide for them. But when men separate from God and depart from him, then what? Does he force his presence on them? 
not for a moment. And when, when that breakdown comes and the, the departing Spirit of God naturally, of course, leaves these mighty powers out of control with disastrous consequences. To explain this principle, let's go back to the story of Egypt in Exodus, the, I think the seventh chapter, which deals with the arrival of Moses at the court of the king to beseech him to let the people of Israel go. I think it's quite important we do recognise this principle, otherwise we'll miss the whole point of the flood as it fell upon mankind. Now, as you remember, of course, Israel was, was the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians. We mentioned this yesterday for quite a few years, several centuries altogether. And during that time, the Egyptians became very proud, very wealthy, and very powerful. In fact, the mightiest nation upon the face of the earth at that point of time. And they became more and more self-sufficient, more and more separated from God, more and more apostate, more and more cruel in their treatment of the Israelites. And Moses was called of God to go down to Egypt to speak to Pharaoh and ask him to let the Israelites go. In other words, ask him to repent of his sins and, and, and obey God. Now, Pharaoh was um, reluctant to do this, of course. He, he didn't understand the principle that he was under threat from mighty, mighty natural forces around about him. Now, Satan definitely has power to control the elements up to a point. And that's proved by the experience of Job, whom we mentioned yesterday too, when, when Satan said to God, put forth your hand and touch all that he has, he will curse you to your face. God said to Satan, you go and do what you like to him, and I'm sure he will still stand firm and true. So Satan went out from the presence of God, and began to manifest his control of the elements of storm and wind and tempest and in no time at all flocks and herds, houses, lands and even children were swept away by Satan's enormous power. Now if we consider the situation in the land of Egypt we find that in that land there were the people of Israel, I'll go across this side of the board I think, in the land of Egypt, living in the land of Goshen, just next, next to Egypt, was Israel. And within that family of, of Israel, there was the line through whom Jesus Christ, the great champion, would be born. And Satan well knew Christ's power, and Satan well knew that when Jesus Christ was born, he would almost certainly lose his kingdom. So therefore, to ensure that he would never have to fight this battle with the Saviour, what was the best plan for him to do? Slay the people of God to whom he'd come in the first case. So there would be no righteous line down to the Saviour of mankind. So that Satan then, very obviously, surrounded the Israelites with every possible weapon of destruction and was determined to obliterate them from the face of the earth if he possibly could, so as to prevent the, his exposure or defeat at the hands of the, of the coming Messiah. Now, because Egypt and the Israelites were virtually living next door to each other, to destroy one would mean to destroy the other. And so, when Moses came back to Pharaoh, this was a situation prevailing at that point of time. Now, in order for God to convey to Pharaoh what was about to happen to him, he had Moses enact the coming drama by using his shepherd's rod. And as you recall, Moses threw down his rod in Pharaoh's presence and what did it become? It became a serpent. Now, note very carefully that while ever that rod remained in Moses' hands, it did not become a serpent, which symbolised the great destroyer. It did not. Let's notice now the symbolism contained here. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 7. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. So in Pharaoh's presence, what did Moses symbolize under God's direction? God. I have made you as God to Pharaoh. So therefore what Moses did was a picture of what God would do in his coming relationship with the land of Egypt. Now that rod in Moses' hand was a symbol of what? The powers of God the wind, the rain, the storm, the tempest, electricity, and all those mighty forces. 
And while ever Moses held in his hand that rod, that symbolized the fact that God still had under control the great forces of nature. And while they're under God's control, there was no way by which they could become forces of destruction. But the moment that Moses let the rod pass out of his control, what did they become? They became great forces of destruction. And then, of course, they followed the plague of waters becoming blood, frogs invading the land, lice, flies, diseased livestock, boils, hail, and um, locusts, finally the plague of darkness, and then the death of the firstborn of Egypt. Now, when Moses threw his rod down, Pharaoh very confidently directed his magicians to throw their rods down, and sure enough, they all appeared to become servants as well which Pharaoh was simply saying, well, I'm not afraid, Moses, of your rod because I have more than you've got and I can certainly consume, consume you or, or control them. But which Pharaoh was saying he didn't need God. He could manage to take care of himself quite adequately without the divine intervention. Whereupon Moses' rod ate up all the other servants to teach very plainly, of course, a man cannot control nature out of control. So the point is this now that while ever God maintains control of the elements, they cannot and they will not be destroyers. Never. God is never in the fire, the earthquake, or the great wind, as Elijah learned later on. But let God lose control of those things and they can only become a force of destruction. Let's, let's make the point as follows. Supposing you're driving a car down the highway at, shall we say, 60 miles per hour. Now, while, you're under control, while it's under your control... And so the other cars around about you too, of course. There's no danger, is there? You're safe. But take your hands off the wheel and leave the power on and lose control of that car. What, 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 will, it, what will it only become? A destroyer. Won't it? It can't be anything else but a destroyer. Nothing else but that. So likewise, when God loses control of nature, because of man's apostasy, it can only become a great destroyer. And God desired to teach this lesson to Pharaoh that day, to, to impress upon his mind that fact. But when, when the king would not heed the word, of course, then this drama took place. And then Moses put his hand out and took hold of the servant, servant again and instantly returned and became a rod once more. It, it could not be anything but a rod of blessing in Moses' hands and only a servant of destruction out of his hands. So then, when in, in Noah's day, after 120 years of faithful preaching, the people of God moved farther and farther away from, from him, the time came when there were only eight people left upon the entire face of the earth, a mere eight of them, who did want to have God's saving presence amongst them, and all the rest did not want God to be there. So what, what, what was God forced to do? He never compels, he never... He never dictates, he never forces. So what, what, what did he have to do? He had to, he had to leave, he had to, right? Now, as he left, of course, the moon became the first to feel the departing power and it went out. It withdrew itself and went out and became nothing but a dead, cold, well, at first to be a glowing ember, but then with great, great loose of heat and become a cold heap of dirt out there. So here is a moon now which has withdrawn itself. Which means that the same amount of heat which we're, now, which we're now getting from the sun was withdrawn from the scene altogether. And as God moved farther away, the sun began to diminish in power to six sevenths, right down until it became only one seventh of its former brightness. Now, that meant, of course, one eighth of the heat which previously had warmed up that cloud and kept it in space was, was gone. And what was the only and, and, as that, and as that cloud naturally cooled, cooled down because of this loss of heat, what then was the only possible consequence? When you cool cloud, what happens? It rains. You have condensation. And uh, you begin to appreciate, of course, the, the tremendous uh, storm power which must have brewed up when this loss of heat was felt and the clouds began to condense into rain and, and pour upon this earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And all the water which had been on the earth on the first day of creation, went back to the same earth on this flood day. And obviously, of course, the earth became flooded again from pole to pole, and there was not one piece of dry land appearing anywhere upon the face of the entire world. Now, I read a Reader's Digest article quite a few years ago, 
which was extremely informative in regard to this, and it pointed out, although I didn't know quite how, it, it, didn't, it didn't know how it happened, but it pointed out how the mastodons became deep frozen in, in the polar regions. And I made some calculations, first of all, to show how difficult it is to deep freeze or quick freeze such a huge carcass. So, so that the animal dies so instantly that the buttercups in its mouth remain unchewed. And that's what they found in these bodies. And uh, the whole mammoth is there in one piece, dying instantly, and at the same time preserving the entire carcass in, in solid ice. And they figured that uh, there would have been tremendous upswellings of, of um, moisture and, and wind at the, polar, at the equatorial regions, going up to 1,000 miles in the atmosphere and coming down again at the poles, super cold, super, super cold, and hitting those mastodons, deep freezing them virtually instantly and killing them on the spot. Now, that's how the flood occurred, of course. Now we might ask ourselves the question, how then, we, how then do we have dry land at the present time of all that uh, water that flooded the earth back then is now here? Why, why are we flooded from pole to pole at the present time? And there are very good reasons for this. One is that there's an enormous amount of water trapped in the ice flows at the north and the south poles. Secondly, of course, the, the earth suffered tremendous um, c c contortions or... Um, what's what I want... Uh, Pardon? Upheaval is good, that's the word, upheavals. And the huge ocean troughs were formed, the great mountain upthrusts were formed, and this meant that enough water was stored in those ocean depths to leave enough dry land for mankind to live on the earth at the present time. Now, it also means, too, of course, that we may ask ourselves the question, why didn't the sun withdraw itself completely? And here's a simple answer. As the sun was diminishing in power, and the flood rains were falling upon the earth, millions upon millions of folk were being destroyed, and that began to change the balance of power, whereas there had been only eight on God's side, and millions against God. Now, now there were virtually only eight left, and of course then God's departure could be stopped, and, and it did stop at that point where the sun was one-seventh of its former brightness. Then God could return to this earth and begin a reconstruction of this earth sufficient to give mankind a period of probation until the fires do the final destruction at the very end. So then to sum the presentation up in a few words, the mistake made by scientists of today is to suppose that all things continue as they were from the very beginning, which is not true. There was a great stroke of, of, uh, of uh, trouble upon mankind which came at the flood 1656 years after creation. And conditions upon the earth were vastly different before the flood from what they have been since the flood. Before the flood, there was no radiocarbon-14 consum... Um, con uh, what's the word? Uh, 14... Just lost what I wanted there. Uh, uh, there was no radio bombardment, no radio-14 bombardment upon the earth, no absorption by plants and animals, and therefore anything before the flood gives a zero reading, which makes science think it's 30 million years of age. But the great changes which have taken place, of course, have produced vastly changed climatic conditions. But in the restoration, God will give back to mankind this perfect climate once more, when the sun shall be seven times as bright as it presently is, and the moon as bright as the sun, and they shall not go down nor withdraw themselves again forever. So, once again, scientists have, have found that their theories do not successfully repudiate the truths of God's word. In fact, the latest reports say that mankind has lost faith in his radiocarbon clock and recognises that it has become an unreliable measure, measuring instrument for these things. The truth remains that by God's creative power, the heavens and the earth were formed in six short days about 6,000 years ago, no more than that. And at the end of 6,000 years, we're fine, we run out of time, and Christ will return to take his people home to their eternal kingdom. Let's turn to Psalms 33 for our closing scripture this morning to um, note the way in which the Lord did make the heavens and the earth. I guess I've not quite, got quite the reference, but the scripture says that by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host then by the word of his mouth which spake and was done, he commanded and stood fast.
Verse 6. Verse 6. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, that all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's the way in which God made the heavens and the earth a mere 6,000 years ago, not by a long process of evolution that encompasses millions upon millions of years. Let's believe the word of God because that same creative power is redemptive power, but the same power we are restored to his divine image as Adam was in the first case.